So welcome back to unit six. Uh, we're still talking about learning, but we are on module 29, biology, cognition, and learning. It's kind of a long one. There are, let's see, five learning targets. So <laughs> you can hear my dog in the background, sorry about that. The first one is to be able to explain how biological constraints affect classical and operant conditioning. Um, then to be able to explain how cognitive processes affect classical and operant conditioning. Basically how cognition really has an effect and it makes it a little more complicated than just the classical and operant conditioning that we learned about in the previous modules. The third one is to be able to identify the two ways people learn to cope with personal problems to be able to describe how a perceived lack of control can affect people's behavior and health. And then finally, to be able to explain why self-control is important and discuss whether it can be depleted. So how do biological constraints affect classical conditioning? Remember classical conditioning in your mind, you should be thinking classical conditioning, Pavlov's dogs, John Watson, and baby Albert, scaring the baby, remember that, with Rosalie Rayner. Okay, in 1956, so this is a couple decades, a few decades after Watson's studies, um, right when Skinner was, you know, really working um, in the field of behaviorism with operant conditioning. Um, at that time, learning researcher Gregory Kimball proclaimed, just about any activity of which the organism is capable can be conditioned, and these responses can be conditioned to any stimulus that the organism can perceive. Well, in 1981, 25 years later, he humbly acknowledged that half a thousand scientific reports kind of proved him wrong. So as we learned in the very first module, I believe in this class, <clears throat> one of the really uh, fundamental uh, principles that we need to hold as scientists is that we need to be humble. And it is something that you have to get used to that you may think something as a psychologist or any type of scientist, and then science will prove you wrong. And you'll have to sort of pivot and understand that you have to make some changes in your belief system. So does that mean we can't teach any organism anything? Well, more than the early behaviors realized, an animal's capacity for conditioning is limited by biological constraints. For example, each species predispositions prepare it to learn the associations that enhance its survival. Thinking back in evolutionary terms, an evolutionary phenomenon called preparedness. Environment isn't the whole story. Biology also matters. And you know, we can remember we learned about this in some of the earlier modules on the biological basis of behavior and you know, what we learned about genetics and twin studies and, you know, biology matters. So does the environment. And this model, the biopsychosocial model that we've shown several times throughout the course, are learning results not only from environmental experiences, but also from cognitive and biological influences. This is called the biopsychosocial approach, with the biological influences being those genetic predispositions unconditioned responses, adaptive responses, and neural mirroring. The psychological influences within this model are previous experiences, predictability of associations, generalization, discrimination, and expectation. The sociocultural influences are culturally learned preferences, motivation affected by the presence of others, and modeling. So who was John Garcia? He was among those who challenged the prevailing idea that all associations can be learned equally well. So Garcia and Colling exposed a group of rats to a particular taste, sight, or sound, and later also to radiation or drugs that led to nausea and vomiting. Sorry for my cursor going all around. <laughs> um, so what did they find? First, even if sickened as late as several hours after tasting a particular new flavor, the rats thereafter avoided that flavor. Second, the sickened rats developed conditioned aversions to tastes, but not to sights or sounds. And this 
makes adaptive sense from an evolutionary perspective. For rats, the easiest way to identify tainted food is to taste it. If sickened after sampling a new food, they therefore avoid it. This response is called taste aversion, and likely you have experienced some form of taste aversion in your life. I definitely have. Um, this example up here is from oysters. If you've had oysters and you got sick from eating them, you probably have a hard time eating them again. Their taste and smell may become a conditioned stimulus for nausea. And this learning occurs readily because our body wants to keep us safe, wants to prepare us to learn to taste, to have aversions to things that are potentially toxic. I have an example of this um, with ranch dressing. When I was about 17 years old, I got really sick after, like immediately after having a lunch where I had a salad with ranch dressing. I could not eat anything or even smell ranch dressing for 20 years. Then all of a sudden I realized I tasted it again somehow. And I was like, oh, I kind of like this. But for like 20 years, it was almost 20 years exactly, I think, I could not even stand being around the smell of it. So I had a very strong taste aversion to ranch dressing. And now I like it. Okay, taste aversion application. In one conditioned taste aversion study, coyotes and wolves were tempted into eating sheep carcasses laced with a sickening poison. After that, they developed an aversion to sheep meat. Two wolves later penned with a live sheep seemed to actually fear it. So it's an interesting way to use this process of taste aversion by a farmer. Um, how do biological constraints affect operant conditioning? So Robert Heinlein, a science fiction writer said, never try to teach a pig to sing. It wastes your time and annoys the pig. <laughs> so biological constraints predispose organisms to learn associations that are naturally adaptive. So it would be really tough to teach a pig to sing. Um, but just yesterday I saw an article, it just came out, it was a speech language pathologist in Los Angeles created this soundboard with words that her dog was actually learning to communicate with words by touching, like, I think it had something like, I want to say nine or 12 different words the dog could put, put her paw on, and it would say, like, outside or happy or things like that, and the dog was learning to associate those words with, you know, what they actually meant. It was kind of cool, um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to teach a pig to sing, probably because of biological constraints. So pigeons can easily be conditioned to flap their wings to avoid being shocked and to peck to obtain food. Fleeing with their wings and eating with their beaks are natural pigeon behaviors, but pigeons would have a hard time learning to peck to avoid a shock or to flap their wings to obtain food. So instinctive drift, what is that? It's the tendency of learned behavior to gradually revert to biologically predisposed patterns. Pigs conditioned to pick up large wooden dollars and deposit them in a piggy bank began to drift back to their natural ways. They dropped the coin, pushed it in them with their snouts as pigs are prone to do, picked it up again, and then repeated the sequence, delaying their food reinforcement. So how do cognitive processes affect classical conditioning? In the dismissal of mentalistic, if you remember Pavlov and Watson um, and Skinner for the most part, dismissed mentalistic concepts. They thought cognition was a black box and that to be scientific, psychology had to be really only focused on overt behaviors. But they underestimated the importance of the effects of cognitive processes. Those thoughts, perceptions, and expectations are extraordinarily important. Two researchers, Rescorla and Wagner in 1972, showed, interestingly, that an animal can learn the predictability of an event. So the more predictable the association, the stronger the conditioned response. It's as if the animal learns an expectancy and awareness of how likely it is that the unconditional stimulus will occur. So it's a bit more complicated because we do, both humans and animals have cognitions that are also involved in the process of learning. So how do associations influence attitudes when British children viewed novel new cartoon characters along either ice cream or Brussels sprouts, they came to prefer the, prefer the ice cream associated characters. Now, interestingly, Brussels sprouts are something I now love. I used to hate them, <laughs> but I now love them. So I would be happy to um, prefer the 
characters that were associated with the Brussels sprouts over ice cream now that I'm older. How are associations limited in their influence on attitudes? People receiving therapy for alcohol use disorder may be given alcohol spiked with a nauseating drug. This is the treatment that has been used and still used. Do they associate the alcohol with sickness? If classical conditioning were merely just a matter of stamping in stimulus associations, we might hope so, and sometimes it does occur. But knowing that the nausea is induced by the drug, thinking about it, using our cognitive capacities, not the alcohol, often weakens the associations between drinking alcohol and feeling sick, therefore reducing the treatment's effectiveness. So even in classical conditioning, it is, especially with humans, not simply the conditioned stimulus, unconditioned stimulus association, but also the thought, your cognitions that matter, that count. In their dismissal of mentalistic concepts, such as consciousness, Pavlov and Watson underestimated the importance, again, of the effects of those cognitive processes. So cognitive mapping, how does that fit into this whole, um, all of this information about learning? So what is a cognitive map? It's a mental representation of the layout of, an of one's environment. For example, after exploring a maze, Rats act as if they have learned a cognitive map of it. Here's a little funny cartoon from the Myers textbook. The term latent learning means that learning, uh, learning that's occurring but is not apparent, it's latent, until there is an incentive to demonstrate that you do know something. So in a classic experiment, rats in one group repeatedly explored a maze always with a food reward at the end. Rats in another group explored the maze with no food reward, but once given a food reward at the end, rats in the second group thereafter ran the maze as quickly as the always rewarded rats. So that was research done, you see that was pretty early in 1930, and it's um, Tolman and Hanzik, and the Tolman is the one who's often referred to when they're talking about the cognitive mapping studies. So latent learning involves our cognitions. The point to remember is there's more to learning than associating a response with a consequence. There's also cognition. So while those behaviorists came up with a lot of wonderful information to help us understand learning, later on, a lot of you know, people studying cognitions realized there was a bit more to it. Insight learning is a sudden realization of a problem solution. It contrasts with strategy-based solutions. So it's just sort of coming up with a sudden realization of the answer to something, all of a sudden. Okay, these two terms are really important within this class and within life. <laughs> Understanding the difference between extrinsic and intrinsic motivation. When I worked as a school psychologist, oftentimes, Motivation was, a, was problematic among students that I was working with, and it was often a big concern with parents uh, who were struggling with kids who were not that motivated for whatever they wanted them to be motivated for. So to differentiate, extrinsic motivation is a desire to perform a behavior to receive promised rewards or avoid threatened punishment. So you are motivated by something outside of yourself. It's extrinsic. Intrinsic motivation, on the other hand, is a desire to perform a behavior effectively for its own sake. So you could probably think about different things that you might be extrinsically motivated to do and those that are intrinsically, you're intrinsically motivated to do. So for this class, are you feeling pressured to finish your homework before a deadline? Worried about your grade? Wanting to get college credit by doing well on the AP exam? If yes, then you are more extrinsically motivated. Are you finding the material interesting? Even if there was no grade involved or grade at stake, would you be curious to learn the, want to learn the material, learn more about it? If yes, then you're being motivated intrinsically. What's really, really important to understand about um, in, intrinsic and extrinsic motivation is that if people promise a reward for a task that is already enjoyable, that is already something that an, indiv an individual is intrinsically motivated to do, this can backfire. There's a term called the over-justification effect. Excessive rewards 
You know, if someone loves playing soccer, right? Say a kid loves playing soccer and the parents all of a sudden decide I'm going to pay them for every goal they score. He could potentially, not 100% of the time, but there is some evidence that excessive rewards like that can actually destroy the intrinsic motivation of the child, the desire to perform the behavior just for its own sake. So that's why we have to be really careful about um, too much extrinsic reinforcement for things that are some, that's something that people already enjoy doing. So although this isn't in the, you didn't read about it in the AP, in the Myers AP text, this is a term, the over -justification, justification effect is a term that is likely to appear in the AP exam. Just to make sure you understand it, the over justification effect occurs when an expected external incentive, such as money or prizes, decreases a person's intrinsic motivation to perform a task. So, what does some of the research say on how cognition impacts extrinsic motivation? In experiments, children have been promised a payoff for playing with an interesting puzzle or toy. Later, they played with the toy less than did the unpaid children. So did paying, it's, it, what appears, what's in first, oops, sorry, is that giving, promising the children um, the extrinsic reinforcement actually decreased intrinsic motivation, the joy they just got from the to playing with the puzzle itself or toy. Likewise, rewarding children with toys or candy for reading diminishes the time they spend reading. So especially for a kid that already loves to read, if you go ahead and then promise them toys or candy for reading, it can actually reduce um, their motivation to read. So what are the biological and cognitive influences on operating classical conditioning? I'll leave these up here for a second. So in what two ways do people learn to cope with personal problems? Sort of a shift in the way we're thinking about things now. So problem-focused coping is attempting to alleviate stress directly by changing the stressor or the way we interact with the stressor. Emotion-focused coping is attempting to alleviate stress by avoiding or ignoring a stressor and attending to the emotional needs related to our stress reaction. You can see the differences there. What does the term personal control mean? It's basically our sense of impacting and directing our environment rather than feeling helpless. It's our sense of self-direction. Do we feel like we are the captains of our own ship? Do we have control? And it's an important thing for us to feel like we have control as humans. What, how does a perceived lack of control affect behavior, people's behavior and health? Well, there's been research with rats showing that two, two rats receive simultaneous shocks. One can turn a wheel to stop the shocks, so they have some control. The helpless rat that has no control um, becomes more susceptible to physical illnesses. So lacking control has been related to being more susceptible to physical illnesses. In humans too, research shows that uncontrollable threats trigger the strongest stress response. So some very famous research in the field of psychology done by Martin Seligman um, helped to come up with this term learned helplessness, which just means the hopelessness and passive resignations, resignation an animal or person acquires when unable to avoid repeated aversive events. So if, if, if an animal or person feels like they have no control, no ability to avoid something very aversive, they develop, are likely to develop learned helplessness. In experiments by Seligman and Meyer, dogs were strapped in a harness and given repeated shocks, poor dogs, with no opportunity to avoid them. Later, when placed in another situation where they could escape the punishment by simply leaping a hurdle, the dogs displayed learned helplessness. They cowered as if without hope. 
Other dogs that had been to, able to escape the first shocks reacted differently. They had learned they were easily in control. They could easily escape the shocks in the new situation. So their behavior was different. They didn't display that learned helplessness. So why does perceived loss of control predict health problems? Losing control provokes an outpouring of stress hormones. When rats cannot control shock or when humans or other primates feel unable to control their environment, stress hormone levels rise, blood pressure increases and immune responses drop. So not having control over your life or animals not having control can lead to your stress levels rising and causing all kinds of different physical problems and emotional ones. Let's look at the research on stress and control. Captive animals experience more stress and are more vulnerable to disease than their wild, their wild counterparts. Okay, that was some research done in 1998. In 1993, a study done by Fox et al. showed that the greater nurses, a nurse's workload, the higher their cortisol level, the stress, the stress hormone level, and blood pressure, but only among nurses who reported little control over their environment. Also, the crowding in high-density neighborhoods, prisons, and colleges, and university dorms is another source of diminished feelings of control and of elevated levels of stress hormones and blood pressure. So related to all this stuff on control is some really interesting research by Julian Rotter, who differentiated external and internal locus of control. And people that have a primarily external locus of control have the perception that chance or outside forces beyond their personal direction determine what happens to them, determines their fate. On the other hand, people that have an internal locus of control feel that they are able to direct and create their own fate. Research has shown that internals, those with an internal locus of control, have achieved more in school and work, act more independently, enjoy better health, and feel less depressed than the externals. People with an internal locus of control at age 10 exhibit less obesity, lower blood pressure, and less distress at age 30. Compared with non-leaders, military and business leaders, have lower than average levels of stress hormone and report less anxiety thanks to their greater sense of control. So how would you define self-control? It's the ability to control impulses and delay short-term gratification for long-term re rewards. A number of performing artists make their living as very convincing human statues like this one on the right. What do we know about self-control and its importance? Well, self-control is actually predictive of good health. And remember when we're saying predictive, that means they're correlated as um, higher low, as, as you measure, have higher measured levels of self-control, you have, tend to have higher levels of good health, higher income and better school performance. In studies of American, Asian and New Zealander children, self-control outdid intelligence test scores in predicting future academic and life success. You may have heard about the next study we're going to talk about, um, about control. So self-control varies over time. Like a muscle, it tends to weaken after use, recover after rest, and grow stronger with exercise. So um, this example is in one famous experiment, hungry people had spent some of their willpower resisting the temptation to eat chocolate chip cookies, then abandoned a tedious task sooner than others did. So their self-control may have uh, sort of weakened a little bit after use. And they lost, you know, their ability to focus on a tedious task sooner than those who hadn't had to utilize all their willpower. Okay, that was a long, that's a pretty long module, but we are back to our learning targets. So let's start with the first one. Learning target one for module 29. How, does, how do biological constraints affect classical and operant conditioning? So we know, after going through all this information, and hopefully you're following along the textbook, the conditioning is limited by biological constraints. Learning is adaptive. Each species learns behaviors that aid its survival. This is called preparedness. 
our preparedness to associate a conditioned stimulus with an unconditioned stimulus that follows predictably and immediately is often adapted. Not always, though. During operant training, animals may display instinctive drift by reverting back to those biologically predisposed patterns. So learning target two, how do cognitive processes affect classical and operant conditioning? So in classical conditioning, animals may learn when to expect an unconditioned stimulus, and they may be aware of the link between stimuli and responses. Whereas in operant conditioning, cognitive mapping, should be thinking about Tolman, and latent learning, research demonstrate the importance of cognitive processes in learning. Learning can occur after little or no systematic interaction with our environment. We call that insight learning and excessive rewards. Driving extrinsic motivation can actually undermine intrinsic motivation. And what two ways do people learn to cope with personal problems? So we can use the two different ways that were discussed within this module. Problem-focused coping, when we feel a sense of control over a situation to change the stressor or the way we interact with it, or emotion-focused coping, when unable to avoid the stressors and intend to the emotional needs related to the stress. These strategies can be a little bit harmful if they are misused, though, so you have to be careful. How does a perceived lack of control affect people's behavior and health? Well, feeling helpless, hopeless, and depressed is problematic for animals and for humans. When experiencing bad events beyond our personal control, being unable to avoid repeated aversive events can lead to learned helplessness. And a lot of research in that area was done by Martin Seligman. People who perceive an internal locus of control achieve more. Remember, those are the people that have, feel like they have more control over what's happening. They feel like they're in control of their own fate. They achieve more, enjoy better health, and are happier than those who have an external locus of control, think that things are out of their control. A perceived lack of control provokes an outpouring of hormones that puts people's health at risk. Finally, the last one, the last learning target for this module, explain why self-control is important and discuss whether it can be depleted. So self-control requires attention and energy, but it predicts good health. It's important. It predicts good health, higher income, better school performance, among other things. Studies have shown self-control can be a better predictor of future academic and life success and even intelligence test scores. Some research shows that. Self-control varies over time, and while researchers disagree about the factors influencing it, strengthening self-control can lead to a healthier, happier, and more successful life. So self-control is important. Okay, we are to the end of module number 29, so thank you for listening and take care.